Um, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I'll try to make it not too long and then we can uh, have some question and answer at the end. Um, so what I'm gonna begin with, I'm gonna share screen, um, just a, a short background. Uh, I'm a professor, I teach at the University of District of Columbia, Washington, DC. And my background is as an historian. Uh, I primarily teach courses on US history and I've earlier taught courses on African-American women's history, comparative courses with women in South Asia, particularly in India. I've also been an administrator in higher education and I'm also a poet and writer, which we'll talk a little bit about later as we go along. So the format I'm gonna follow is that in the beginning we have a, 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 a short interactive exercise. I'll explain to you. I will provide a link in the chat box but before I do that, let me explain to you what we are going to do. So give me one second to share screen. And I'm gonna turn my video off because I keep getting that small image. So hopefully everyone can see this. What we are going to do today is, and I have two examples here. I want you to write, I, I, what I want you to do is think of what you, uh, what you believe in or what you think your opinion is on the word gender. So the, how you're gonna do is you see this pink circle in the side, you can't do it right now because the link is not with you, but I'm gonna share the link shortly. So you'll click on this pink circle and you can put your name if you wish that's your wish, or you can leave your name out. You click on again on here at the, at the end at this pink um, hexagon and you will go to GIF and then put in what you feel gender means to you. Or you can associate a feeling that you have with the word gender. So for example, I might say refugees, women, refugees. And once you click, you might get some images and picture, and then it's up to you to select an image um, that you think best explains what you are feeling. If you don't find the image, then you go and find another image. So for example, let us say, um, uh, let's just say refugees. So I may select this image. Once you select an image, it will show up in that box. It should have, oh here, sorry. Uh, there, it is gonna show up. So just wait for a few seconds for it to populate on that screen. Once it does that, you press the button publish and it will come on on this screen. So we just want to see what others are feeling. You can leave it anonymous, but let me give you the link to that. Um, one minute. So here you go. I'm going to go back to, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for a second. So you will see the link in your chat box. Just click on the link. It will take you to that bad lot, Padlet. So I hope you can see this uh, link in the chat box. Just click on the link and we are going to go back to sharing screen so that we can all see it in real time. So give me one second. So, Currently, you should be here. I'm going to click it off and come back here. So any one of you, you're welcome to click on this pink, deep pink circle on the side here. Write your name if you wish. If not, go to the hexagon here. Click on GIF. If you're feeling um, hopeful, for example, about the way gender is across the world, you can put hope and click on that. So you can put an emotion or you can put, uh, find an image that best symbolizes what you believe gender means. So click on that image, it will populate 
and then you publish. So I'm just gonna keep quiet for a few minutes and let folks um, pull up the images or words they best feel right now. So while folks are uh, putting up their emotions or their opinions on the word gender, I'm just going to go through some of them. We have a scale here. So tipping, because gender is, can mean various things, women, men, LGBTQIA. So it could mean a number of uh, definitions it could have. So you see the scales here, um, there's a box, a gentleman is holding a box, not sure maybe what the box contains, things like beauty and gender. Yes, girl power I see here. I'm just misunderstood. Belonging, being, becoming, exercising. Our diversity is our power. Gender affirming care is life-saving care. We are only human. Hope is necessary. So these are all really excellent. I am going to um, send the link of this Padlet later on so that you can have it with you and you can look at it and maybe add to it later on. So for now, we will exit from this. And what I'm going to do is take you to another Padlet. I hope you can still see the screen. Yes. Can you, can you see the screen, Amber? Yes, I can see the screen. Okay, great. Okay. So I'm just gonna go, you know, do a little sh a short background on what um, gender could imply, can imply, uh, talk about issues of uh, concern globally in terms of gender, particularly with a focus on women. So let's begin with the world population. The current world population is over 7.9 billion. And uh, currently out of which 50.4 are men and 49.6 women. And here I wanted to start with terminologies because the words we employ are critical for our understanding of anything in life. So I just wanted to use an ex uh, so wanted to uh, share with you a couple of words that could have various meanings or may have been misunderstood or have changed over time. So gender primarily, the dictionary meaning of gender is it's a grammatical category, often designated as male, female, or neuter and used in the classification of nouns, pronouns, adjectives, etc. And so women's rights, 
That's definitely something we're going to focus on. Women's rights are human rights. So that's something that has been in discussion even academically uh, for many decades, particularly since the 1970s, because 1970s was a time when you had this growth of uh, new history. You had a lot of historians writing on uh, previously or, or still marginalized uh, in the, uh, individuals and categories across the globe. So whether they were women, Native Americans, African Americans, so a lot of new history came out in the 19, late 1960s and 70s with a focus on that women's rights are actually human rights. And all these words that I'm, I have listed here are only a selection. There could be any number of other words. And I would encourage you to create your own list. And I would also encourage you that when you create your own list, keep the different layers that can be associated with each. So remember race, ethnicity, religion, country of origin, language, and culture. So let me click on this for a second. This is just a diagram, which is part of a, a terminology that I had developed a, a few years ago. It's called DIAL, which is diversity and inclusion applied in layers. So when someone asks me how I would identify myself, I can't just say one thing because we all have so many different layers. So I would probably end up saying human, woman, Hindu, from India, now US citizen, single mom, professional, professor, writer. So there are different terminologies that I would employ to describe or identify myself with. And this is a, a, a representation of British mathematician John Wen's diagram, uh, but it's been changed to show that you can have different circles or different sizes, depending on what you find most critical in explaining or defining yourself. So whenever we are understanding any of these terminologies, uh, we have to remember these different layers as well. So it's not just when I'm talking about women, it's impossible to talk about all women. So I, uh, we have to keep in mind that, you know, we have to further uh, diversify the way we look at uh, human rights and women rights across the world. Then terminologies like gender studies, women's studies. So in the 1970s, when uh, there was a growth of new history, a uh, lot of universities came up with women's studies departments. And only later on, it changed to gender studies to make it wider and more inclusive and not just focus on women's issues, but men as well and LGBTQI. Um, feminism, womanism. So there's a slight difference between the two. Uh, primarily feminism is employed, uh, was employed and, and not so much as, as of now, but was employed in the 20th century to um, uh, focus or, on, upon or identify white women's movements. Whereas women of color, African-American women tended to call themselves uh, they were womanists rather than being feminists because African-American women were focusing more on race reform. And that focus is still there because complete change has not occurred. Similarly, for example, I am from India. To give you the example of India, in India, caste system is very acutely entrenched in society. And even though caste system like slavery in the United States, caste system was also abolished in India in 1950 after the British left India in 1947, but still in day-to-day uh, -day life in small villages, in towns, even in urban areas, the, uh, the uh, divisions that different castes uh, can have with each other uh, definitely permeates in the society. So Indian women, South Asian women, and women in India also tended to focus on uh, being known as womenists pre-independence because they were focusing on national freedom. So to understand those differences, it's particularly when you're focus, focusing on global issues for women, feminism and womanism, women of color uh, have tended to uh, call themselves more as womanists. 
uh, not to say that they are not very strong feminist uh, black women writers, for example, Bell Hooks, uh, but just to understand historically the distinction between the two. So women's empowerment, uh, women's empowerment, of course, we understand, you know, at the grassroots level, at state, national and global levels. And I wanted to give you one example again, because this, the focus of this uh, webinar today is global understanding of particularly of women's issues. And I fall, uh, fall back on Indian uh, example a lot because I am from India. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the system of panchayat here. If you see the word here, panchayat, panchayat comes from the word panch, P-A-N-C-H. And it basically means five, like the five fingers of your hand. And uh, a panchayat is the basic uh, unit of uh, civil administration in villages. They do not try criminal cases, but they try civil cases like land dispute or dispute over water or, or resources in the village, education and so forth. So in the 1990s, the Indian government really focused on the girl child and in uplifting the status of women in India. And a lot of women ran for the panchayat. They ran to be a member of the panchayat. And many women now, I don't have the exact statistics for that number, but many women in India are now the chief panchayat. So out of the five, one person becomes the chief panchayat, also known as Sar Panch in Hindi. So let's watch this video, which uh, talks about a woman uh, who became a uh, uh, a uh, panch, uh, who got elected to the panchayat in one of the villages of a particular state. If you cannot hear, or, you know, the volume is low, just let me know. After saving a customized car insurance from Liberty Mutual, I customize everything, like Marco's backpack. Yeah. So that was just one short video to show to you the change that has been occurring in India. And she was elected as a Sarpanch, which means the chief punch, chief among the punch in that village. Uh, other things to talk about gender bias, gender abuse and violence. So bias, as you know, especially unconscious bias, we all have that. So I tend to link a lot of my uh, lectures with the overall, an overall understanding of diversity per se and inclusion. And we know that we all have unconscious bias uh, either against someone or against something. That's just human nature. But it's important to recognize that bias and to address it. Then gender abuse, violence occurs all over the world. Um, I'm going to let this video be for the time being. I'll come back to it later. And going on to gender parity and equality. So when you're looking at the word gender gap and equality or parity, there's a difference between the two words. A gender gap basically means the discrepancy in opportunities, status and attitudes between men and women. And equality and parity would be the efforts to reduce that discrepancy over, over, overall. There's an article here on gender gap, which you can certainly look at later on. We also know in the United States, 
for every US dollar is tied slightly increase 82 cents to a dollar. But the wage gap for women of color is not only wider in the United States, but the overall gender wage gap in the overall gender wage gap, but is also closing much more slowly than it is for white women in the United States. So for African-American women, Hispanic women, and Asian women, the gender wage gap is closing much more slowly than it is for white women. Then of course, understanding terminologies, LGBTQIA. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about here about the Equality Act, which has passed with the United States House of Representatives in 2019 primarily meant to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, childbirth, et cetera. Again, there's a video here, a couple of videos I'm leaving out now, but we can come back to that later. I just wanted to do the terminologies first. We'll come back to it, come back to those videos. And then mankind, you know, these kind of terminologies, mankind, human, humankind, Women have for long been saying, saying, why use the terminology mankind? Why not humankind? And uh, as far as race is concerned, there is only one race in the world, that's the human race. Otherwise race is an artificial construct. And I just want you to go back in history, uh, particularly for the United States, that in 1848, uh, uh, we had in the United States, there was the Seneca Falls Convention in way women got together, women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, they got together to write their own declaration and they called it the Declaration of Sentiments. And primarily what they spoke about was that they, they, this, they evoked the Declaration of Independence. And they said that in the Declaration of Independence, it was written that all men are created equal but they created their own declaration called it the Declaration of Sentiments, saying that all men and women are created equal. So that's just a slight history. You know, of course, in the United States, women got the right to vote with the 19th Amendment in 1920. We know that uh, um, after the Civil War ended with the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments, even though uh, uh, slavery was abolished, African uh, everyone was considered a citizen if born in the United States, but men got the right to vote, not women. And African-American men also, their right to vote was not secured for them either. And the way that different women's historical movements developed in the United States, white women's movements, black women's movements, they were very different. Interesting point to note, because we're talking globally and being a um, you know student and practitioner of history, what was happening in 19th century in other parts of the world, Europe had was a little further ahead of the United States. The Industrial Revolution had already taken place in, in Europe. In India, in the mid 19th century, you similarly have women from different classes and castes struggling for uh, their rights. So a lot of parallels and similarities and differences we can notice when we try to analyze historically, the way women's rights emerged across the world. Even words like chairman and chairwoman and chairperson. So nowadays chairperson is used rather than chairman and chairwoman. Mrs. versus Ms. So just to give an example, uh, before I moved to the United States permanently, I was a professor in a college uh, connected to the University of Delhi in the capital of India, New Delhi. And we actually, we women in the college, we led a campaign, signature campaign saying that why when we are, when, uh, when men cannot be identified their marital status, why do you write Mrs. and then within brackets, doctor, if someone had a PhD or not, why do you write Mrs. Dr. So-and-so? Either use the terminology Ms. or just leave it Dr. So-and-so. And, -so. and we, we, we won that round. Uh, in the college at that time. And I'm talking about the early 1990s. Um, men, men, of course, you know, trying to focus on the fact that uh, it's not just women, it's LGBTQIA, men, women. Um, acculturation and biological differences. So I, uh, some of you may have read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, which talks a lot about how society perceives women and men differently in terms of their 
you know, physiology and the biological differences and how women are acculturized from childbirth, how they are raised. Uh, you know, if girls are given dolls to play with and boys are given, uh, I don't know, hopefully not guns, but they are given uh, um, objects that are not necessarily um, orient, uh, related to home. And when I was raising my son, I definitely want, wanted to, uh, you know, make a mention of that. I'm a single mom and I raised my son on my own. And I introduced my son to all kinds of, you know, books and toys when he was growing up so that there is a holistic way that we raise uh, sons. And so that's, that's a bit about, of course, the book talks about other things as well. And then the ban bossy campaign that Cheryl Sandberg led. So let's, let's take a minute. I'm looking at the time to make sure it's already 3.30. All right, so I'm going to try to wrap it up at 3.45. So um, let's look at this video. Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg changed the conversation about women in the workplace with her best-selling book, Lean In, which came out exactly a year ago. And now she's launching a new public service campaign to ban the word bossy. Why? Because she says it's a big part of the reason so few women make it to leadership positions. And there is some research that backs her up. We sat down at Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park to talk about the other B word. When I was growing up, I was called bossy. Cheryl Sandberg, Facebook COO and newly minted billionaire, has launched a campaign today to ban a surprisingly powerful word. Bossy. 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 And she's pulled together a group of celebrity friends to help her pull it off. Ban bossy. This is the other B word. We call girls bossy on the playground. We then call them too aggressive or other B words in the workplace. For the past year, she's traveled the world discussing her best-selling book, Lean In, encouraging well, women to embrace leadership. Right? What we know is that stereotypes are holding women back from leadership roles all over the world. She argues those negative stereotypes get a big boost from the use of the word bossy. I've asked audiences all over the world and this is what women face. They're bossy as little girls, and then they're aggressive, political, shrill, too ambitious as women. Can I just say, I was called bossy. Were you called bossy? I was called bossy when I was in ninth grade. My teacher took my best friend, Mindy, aside, and she said, you shouldn't be friends with Cheryl. She's bossy. And that hurt. We know that by middle school, more boys than girls want to lead. And if you ask girls why they don't want to lead, whether it's the school project all the way on to running for office, they don't want to be called bossy and they don't want to be disliked. We decided to put that to the test. We asked Dr. Harold Koplowitz, a highly respected child psychiatrist, to join us in a conversation with first graders at the Hunter School in New York City. If I said to you, you're bossy, does that make you feel good or bad? Bad, because you don't want to be bossing people around. Because it just means they tell people what to do. They feel like no one will like them if they're bossy. If someone did call me bossy, you just, you should probably say sorry. Raise your hand if anyone's ever called you bossy. A lot of hands up. So what's more important, to be liked or to be a leader? To like, be liked. If you're a leader, your friends will get mad at you and they'll, they won't want to be your friend anymore. No, same thing. What I'm concerned about is that the girls were ready to throw leadership out well, the door and this is exactly for, for friendship. This is exactly what Cheryl Sandberg says, though, is that girls, and by the time they're in junior high school, are completely willing to to say, you know, I'm not raising my hand. I'm not going to be the so, leader. So I would tell you that I don't think it's junior high school. I think it's just the progression that starts now. And junior high school makes it, or middle school makes it worse because there's hormonal changes that only gets exaggerated when you get to that point. In fact, research shows a direct link a third of the girls who don't want to be leaders say it's because they fear being called bossy or being disliked by their peers. If you look at the world, women do 66% of the work in the world. I am going women to uh, come back to you because the video is seven minutes long, but definitely I think you have the link to my lecture. 
and um, do watch that video. And the other videos here, the one I had about uh, violence and abuse is a short video in, uh, taken on a train in India, uh, which really speaks to how men need to be involved in, uh, in being partners with women when you're talking about uh, abuse of women. So this is a very one minute video. So I will watch this and then we'll further move on. Okay, so um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about my story. I mentioned I was, I'm a single mom and I raised my son on my own. And part of my understanding myself and my diversity is to say where I, ca where I came from, where I'm going, what institutions I worked at. So here is a kind of a you know, short image story of you know, my own self and just to share with you, that's my father on the top left. Uh, he was a professor of English and a novelist and he won one of the highest literary awards in India. That's my mother here and that's Indira Gandhi next to her. And Indira Gandhi was one of the first women, prime, one of the first few, not the absolute first, the first woman head of state in, in any country in the world was Golda Meir in Israel. And then you had Indira Gandhi in India. So my mother was principal from K through 12 school and she would invite a lot of leaders to our school to raise funding because it was a gov government funded school. So a lot of leadership I have understood from her. And uh, since we are talking about Indira Gandhi, I wanted to make mention that in India, comparatively, if you look at global issues for women, in India, whereas South Asian countries, there are seven South Asian countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, um, Bhutan, and one more, I'm forgetting. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Bangladesh. So seven countries, they have had women heads of state. So politically, in terms of jobs, they have been you know, right on top, doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, at least in terms of professors. I was a professor there. There's no struggle for equal pay. Men and women to receive the same pay. Maybe in the private sector, there are uh, discrepancies, but not in the government sector. And, but in, in society, socially and culturally, there are a lot of abuses against women in South Asia. Whereas in the West, we have had, not had a woman head of state in the United States, but socially and culturally, there is more freedom in terms of you know, whom you can marry, whether you're divorced or not, whether you're widowed or not, and how society perceives you. So I, I, this was the college that I used to teach in in India. I, I was actually the first female chief election officer in the college, a position held till then only by men faculty. I used to involve myself a lot in administration and I would take up these positions because I wanted to be a mentor and leaders for others. I want people to look up and say, if she can do it, so can we. And the different diverse institutions that I worked at, at Howard University, which is an HBCU, Binghamton University, New York, Berkeley, California, um, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, which is part of the Smithsonian. You can't miss the a majestic building at the corner of the con of Constitution and I-16. And uh, currently I'm at UDC. And as I mentioned, I'm a poet and my latest book actually is called What's Wrong With Us Kali Women. So it's a book which touches upon injustices in the world, um, whether it's racial, ethnic, um, immigration, domestic violence, poverty, and so forth. And Kali is one of the Indian goddesses 
So I've also, who was very dark skinned. So I've also spoken in this book about, um, you know, women, uh, skin color and how skin color is used to divide people around the world. So now coming to just quickly getting to global issues, giving myself only another five, 10 minutes. So in terms of uh, overall global issues in the world, sorry, I hope I'm not missing it out in some way. I've not taken away something, yeah. So anyway, so th there are 12 major issues for globally for women around the world. Um, education, equal pay, genocide, war, civil conflict, early marriage, early pregnancy, poverty, sex trafficking, domestic violence, depression, politics, media, stigma against feminism. I also wanted to say that emotion abuse and psychological violence against women is huge, but it's something that cannot be always shared or spoken about, but there are some statistics that I've shared here. And it, is, it has been noticed by research that emotional abuse of women has risen during the pandemic times. So there are some state, uh, data in this particular box here. I also wanted to say that, you know, because for me, gender means everyone, I definitely wanted to say that we tend to overlook or ignore issues of concern for men across the world. So the 10 major issues, again, as these are only reflective, taken from different websites and something that I wanted to share with you, but certainly you can add more as well. So violence, depression, education, wages, domestic abuse, prostate cancer, workplace deaths, homelessness, family courts, masculinity. So you will see a trend here. There are certain things that are common to all human beings, you know, whether it's poverty or whether it's domestic violence, depression, and the terminologies, masculinity and feminism. So in both genders, you will notice that. Then in terms of LGBTQI, similarly, there are issues of concern some which are similar, which are human concerns, some that are very specific to LGBTQI individuals. So criminaliz criminaliz criminalization of same-sex conduct, religion and gender, death penalty for same-sex conduct. There are seven countries that impose their death penalty, Brunei, Iran, Mauritania, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Yemen or banning literature on LGBTQIA in educational institutions, violence against LGBTQIA, greater health risks, especially during the pandemic. What is uh, the law that has been passed in Florida would be an example of banning literature um, in educational institutions. And in there in Florida, Florida, it is for, I think from primary till third grade. Children as well become part of gender, we cannot overlook the atrocities that are committed against women. So violence through indoctrination, poverty, life as refugees, lack of ac access to education, child neglect, child labor, child prostitution, internet child pornography, child trafficking and slavery, and military use of children. Trying to round off this uh, webinar, I want to draw your attention to the United States, the United Nations efforts in bringing attention to women's rights. Gender equality was made part of international human rights in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But after that, a number of different efforts were made in 1976 to 1985 that was declared as a UN decade for women and so forth. In 1985, you had the Global Conference in Nairobi, 1995 in Beijing. And in each of these conferences, the attempt was to take it one step further to ensure that women's rights were given the same dignity and respect as for all other human beings. And of course, ending with 2015 with the declaration of 17 sustainable development goals. So I wanted to share, say, show uh, here, you know, I, you might have seen very often that uh, women are almost 50% of the population, but they only own 1% of global wealth. So there's kind of a, it's, it's really not exactly true. There are articles, you can later look on to, look into those articles. Uh, there is, they, yes, women do comprise almost 50% of the population, but they own 
20% of the world's property and 40% of the global wealth. Of course, global wealth is measured in various ways. It includes a non-financial assets as well. So overall, when you're talking about, you know, even the United States efforts towards globally women's rights, at the crunch of the issue, the whole issue boils down to decision making in person and professional spaces. What kind of uh, empowerment of freedom women have to make those decisions is what we really have to try to understand and compre comprehend. Some of these countries like the Scandinavian countries, they lead the way in progress towards closing the gender gap. United States is ranked 19th in the world on its gender gap index. So I'm going to uh, end this webinar with this video. I think it's 13 or 14 minutes. And this is by Michael uh, Kimmel, who is an American sociologist and he's a professor. So just let's listen to what he has to say and then we can open for some comments or Q&A. Hi, I'm here to recruit men to support gender equality. Wait, wait, what? What, does, what do men have to do with gender equality? Gender equality is about women, right? I mean, the word women, the word gender is about women. Actually, I'm even here speaking as a middle-class white man. Now, I wasn't always a middle-class white man. It all happened for me about 30 years ago when I was in graduate school. And a bunch of us graduate students got together one day and we said, you know, there's an explosion of writing and thinking in feminist theory, but there's no courses yet. So we did what graduate students typically do in a situation like that. We said, okay, let's have a study group. We'll read a text, we'll talk about it, we'll have a potluck dinner. <laughs> so every week, 11 women and me got together. <laughs> we would read some text in feminist theory and have a conversation about it. And during one of our conversations, I witnessed an interaction that changed my life forever. It was a conversation between two women. One of the women, one of the women was white and one was black. And the white woman said, this is gonna sound very anachronistic now. The white woman said, all women face the same oppression as women. All women are similarly situated in patriarchy and therefore all women have a kind of intuitive solidarity or sisterhood. And the black woman said, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. So the black woman says to the white woman, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, what do you see? And the white woman said, I see a woman. And the black woman said, you see, that's the problem for me. Because when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, she said, I see a black woman. To me, race is visible. But to you, race is invisible. You don't see it. And then she said something really startling. She said, that's how privilege works. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. It is a luxury, I will say, to the white people sitting in this room, not to have to think about race every split second of our lives. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. Now remember, I was the only man in this group. So when I witnessed this, I went, oh no. <laughs> and somebody said, well, what was that reaction? And I said, well, when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I see a human being. I'm kind of the generic person. You know, I'm a middle-class white man. I have no race, no class, no gender. I'm universally generalizable. <laughs> so I like to think that was the moment I became a middle-class white man that class and race and gender were not about other people, they were about me. I had to start thinking about them and it had been privileged that it kept it invisible to me for so long. Now, I wish I could tell you the story ends 30 years ago in that little discussion group, but I was reminded of it quite recently at my university where I teach. I have a colleague and she and I both teach the sociology of gender course on alternate semesters. So she gives a guest lecture for me when I teach I give a guest lecture for her when she teaches. So I walk into her class to give a guest lecture, about 300 students in the room. And 
as I walk in, one of the students looks up and says, oh, finally, an objective opinion. <laughs> All that semester, whenever my colleague opened her mouth, what my students saw was a woman. I mean, if you were to say to my students, there is structural inequality based on gender in the United States, they'd say, well, of course you'd say that. You're a woman. You're biased. When I say it, they go, wow, is that interesting? Is that going to be on the test? How do you spell structural? <laughs> So I hope you all can see this is what objectivity looks like. <laughs> Disembodied Western rationality. <laughs> and that, by the way, is why I think men so often wear ties. <laughs> because if you are going to embody disembodied Western rationality, you need a signifier. And what could be a better signifier of disembodied Western rationality than a garment that at one end is a noose and the other end points to the genitals? <laughs> that is mind-body dualism right there. <laughs> so making gender visible to men is the first step to engaging men to support gender equality. Now, when men first hear about gender equality, when they first start thinking about it, they often think, many, many men think, well, that's right, that's fair, that's just, that's the ethical imperative, but not all men. Some men think the lightning bolt goes off and they go, oh my God, yes, gender equality, and they will immediately begin to mansplain to you your oppression. Uh, they, they, they see supporting gender equality something akin to the cavalry. Like, thanks very much for bringing this to our attention, ladies. We'll take it from here. <laughs> this results in a syndrome that I like to call premature self-congratulation. <laughs> There's another group, though, that actively resists gender equality, that sees gender equality as something that is detrimental to men. I was on a TV talk show opposite four white men. This is the beginning of my, the book I wrote, Angry White Men. These are four angry white men who believed that they, white men in America, were the, were the victims of reverse discrimination in the workplace. And they all told stories about how they were qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions. They didn't get them. They were really angry. And the reason I'm telling you this is I want you to hear the title of this particular show. It was a quote from one of the men. And the quote was, a black woman stole my job. And they all told their stories, qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions, didn't get it, really angry. And then it was my turn to speak. And I said, I have just one question for you guys. And it's about the title of the show. A black woman stole my job. Actually, it's about one word in the title. I want to know about the word my. Where did you get the idea it was your job? Why isn't the title of the show a black woman got the job or a black woman got a job? Because without confronting men's sense of entitlement, I don't think we'll ever understand why so many men resist gender equality. Look, we think this is a level playing field. So any policy that tilts it even a little bit, we think, oh my God, water's rushing uphill. It's reverse discrimination against us. So let me be very clear. White men in Europe and the United States are the beneficiaries of the single greatest affirmative action program in the history of the world. It is called the history of the world. <laughs> so now we've, I've established some of the obstacles to engaging men, but why should we support gender equality? Of course, it's fair, it's right, and it's just. But more than that, gender equality is also in our interest as men. If you listen to what men say about what they want in their lives, gender equality is actually a way for us to get the lives we want to live. Gender equality is good for countries. It turns out, according to most studies, it turns out that those countries that are the most gender equal are also the countries that score highest on the happiness scale. And that's not just because they're all in Europe. <laughs> Even within Europe, 
those countries that are more gender equal also have the highest levels of happiness. It is also good for companies. Research by Catalyst and others has, has shown conclusively that the more gender equal companies are, the, the, better, uh, the, the better it is for workers, the happier their labor force is, they have lower job turnover, they have lower levels of attrition, they have an easier time re recruiting, they have higher rates of retention, higher job satisfaction, higher rates of productivity. So the question that I'm often asked by in, in companies is, boy, this gender equality um, thing, that's really gonna be expensive, huh? And I say, oh no. So I decided to stop the video looking at the time. Amber, um, it's uh, 3.51. And we okay. had said we'd finish at four. So, okay. yeah, so oh, anyone, <laughs> comments, open. But yes, you can, sh in the lecture, the link is there in the lecture. I, um, I want to share with everyone that the presentation that Anita did today, I have the link. So I will share it um, with each of you um, via email, no later than tomorrow morning. And also,